All right, everyone. It's 11 o'clock. Welcome to test review day. So as I said, it'll be pretty similar to the last one in terms of level of difficulty. So if you did well on the first test, then your study habits should be sufficient. I'll start by saying what I'm sure you all are most interested in hearing, which is what the three written will be about. So as before, nine definition questions and three written. Uh, the first written will be about the connection between moral or pro-social behavior and well-being. And I do not mean a connection between how we define morality and well-being, like with Sam Harris. I mean the ways in which uh, moral behavior contributes to one's own well-being. So there you can draw on chapter four or the acronym reading. You can just pick one or do a bit of both, up to you. So is that just an explanation or do it, is it something we should reference certain? You, you'll have to support your answer, okay. so yeah. Uh, the next one will be about uh, Sharon Street's evolutionary argument against moral realism. That one will be more explanation. -based. The third one will be very broad. It will be about uh, the connection between emotion moral judgment. So that one will leave you uh, several options, or give you several options. Any questions about the layout of the written? Yes. Can you just repeat those real quick? Yeah, sure. So, <laughs> yeah. so first one, um, connection between uh, moral behavior and well-being by which I mean your own well-being, not like a utilitarian conception where morality is defined in terms of maximizing well-being. I mean, what are the ways in which your moral behavior contributes to your own well-being? So, as I say for that one, you can draw on chapter four or the Ackman reading. So if you focus on those two, you'll have resources for the first one. Um, Ackman's probably the easier way to go. Uh, Question two will be about Sharon Street's evolutionary argument against moral realism, or in her terms, a mind-independent conception of value. You can use either uh, terminology if you want. Uh, and then the third one will be about uh, uh, reasons to believe there's a connection between emotion and moral judgment. So there you have several options. Uh, just, just to clarification, I, I could have sworn the first time we went through, you said uh, question one was moral behavior and pro-social behavior. So that moral is... behavior slash pro-social behavior okay. and uh, well-being. Okay. Yeah, I think Sharon Street uses the language of pro-social behavior. Uh, the chapter uses the language of moral behavior, but way, either way you want to go is fine. Okay. Yeah, the key though is its connection to well-being. The... All right. And that's your own well-being, not... Not the well-being of you know okay. the wider society, the ways in which it helps you. Yes. For the third question, we we're just trying to show that there is a connection yes. between emotion and moral judgment. Yes. Okay. That'll be one of those you know give reasons to believe this. Okay. So I mentioned last class that uh, the term reason won't appear. By that I mean in the definitions there will be none of the terms like theoretical reason or practical reason. I still may use the locution you know give reasons to believe this in the written. But as far as memorizing the definitions for the key terms, don't have to worry about anything with the word reason in it. Okay, other questions about the written? Okay, so the rest of the time belongs to you all, so you can ask any questions about any of the content in Unit 2. That would be nice. yeah? Well, this is, I had this question prior to you saying that it was one of the long answer, so I'm going to ask it now. Can you re-explain Street's evolutionary Yeah, for sure. So, um, thought, I thought someone might ask this. So, uh, remember there's a distinction between a mind independent conception of value, which is 
uh, basically the moral realist conception of value. And a mind dependent uh, conception of value, which is one version of anti realism. There are other conceptions of anti realism that would be different, but for your purposes, you can treat them synonymously. So uh, take moral values like, you know, it's good to care for children, or it's good to punish cheaters, or reward altruists. So we have these values. What is their status? If you hold to the first conception, then you think that the truth or goodness of these values is independent of whether we recognize them or not. So on that conception, uh, moral judgments are similar to factual judgments. If 500 years ago someone said, all right, well, it's funny, people sometimes think that people thought the world was flat before Columbus. People knew the world, well, at least educated people, knew the world was round as far back as the ancient Greeks. Uh, so let's say 3,000 years ago, someone says the world is flat. That's their judgment about the world. They were just wrong, right? So at least if you're a, a scientific realist. So if you're a scientific realist, which a very large majority of philosophers are, then you think that that person's just mistaken. If you have this conception of moral value, you think the same is true of morality. If 3,000 years ago someone said, you know, uh, slavery is good, they were just wrong. If you have a mind-dependent conception of value, you think that when we express moral judgments, we are just expressing our own values and preferences. But there's no sense in which those values or preferences, you know, accurately or inaccurately describe features of the world. So that's one important thing to understand Street's argument. So with regard to evolution, uh, actually I guess I should say two, uh, Street's argument is an example of uh, a genealogical argument. A genealogical argument is one that tries to undermine your confidence in your belief by uh, saying something about what caused your belief. Now you have to be careful here uh, to say that you can't in any straightforward way say that what caused your belief can show that the belief is false. That would be fallacious. But what you can do is say, this is what caused you to hold your belief, and therefore you should be less confident in it. Or uh, you know, not believe in it anymore. So in the case of evolution, I guess I'll quickly say, so the example she gives that should be intuitive is, if you have a certain belief, you know, you're asked a question, you give an answer, but you're shown a videotape that shows that what caused you to have that belief was a hypnotist, you would probably withdraw that belief. You'd say, I, I don't believe this anymore, at least pending further information. So uh, Street goes along with the assumption, and we saw some reason to tentatively accept this assumption in unit one, that evolution is what caused our basic moral judgments. So there's some story to be told there about kin selection and reciprocal altruism and stuff like that, uh, that, that those are the cause of our basic moral intuitions. That uh, those processes uh, or those, uh, those kinds of behaviors and intuitions increase our chances of spreading our genes, or our ancestors, I should say, and that's why we have these moral judgments. So that's the genealogy of how we got our judgments. And the question is, uh, should that increase or decrease our confidence <coughs> that these judgments are right? And what Street says is, if we have the first conception, right, a mind independent conception of value or a moral realist conception, then evolution is a debunking genealogy. It's one that should cause us to decrease our confidence in our basic moral intuition. Why? Well, think about how evolution works. Uh, genes which give rise to traits that increase your chances of spreading your genes, those genes increase in frequency. Almost true by definition, right? In the case of physical facts, there's a straightforward story to tell about why evolution would give us the ability to recognize physical facts, right? Any organism that didn't have the ability to recognize uh, that there were lions around, those guys and 
gals didn't pass on their genes. Let's suppose that there are mind-independent moral truths. There are these objective moral truths that were true before there were any humans around. Just imagine there are. How could they exert selection pressure in the same way that physical facts do? And it seems to me there's no answer to that question. Uh, physical facts can exert selection pressure, right? The lion eats the guy who can't tell there's a lion around, uh, and therefore he doesn't pass on his genes. But the guy whose eyes are working and whose brain is working, and who can tell there's a lion there, he does pass on his genes. But if it's just an objective moral fact that helping children is morally good, uh, what Street says is there's no way, uh, no conceivable way that could exert selection pressure. Uh, so therefore, we have no reason to believe that evolution would design us to be in accord with these mind-independent moral truths. <coughs> I see some eyes glazing over and some nods. So any questions so far? Sorry, you just said how could, uh, if they were realists, so with the mind in the yeah. independent, how could they exert selection pressure if there is no physical facts? So the question is just, if there are these objective moral truths, how could those truths exert selection pressure? Um, and the answer seems to be there's no way they could. Now, you don't have to agree with that. You can think that's wrong, and some people do think it's wrong, but that's the logic of the argument. Yeah? Does Street argue for mind-dependence? Yeah, so what she, I think someone asked a similar question. What she says is uh, the mind-dependent conception of value is safe from this argument. You may or may not endorse it, but um, yeah, it, it, it survives this, this test. There's a straightforward story to tell about why evolution would make us value things, like care for children, uh, be mad at cheaters, etc. Um, there's just no reason to think that those values correspond to some kind of mind-independent truth. Any other questions about this part? reduce, for mind independence, it should reduce our confidence in its objective correctness. But for mind dependent, does it increase our confidence or does it do neither? I have to read the article now. carefully. I don't think she says it should increase our confidence. I think she just says it's safe from the objection. Uh, you could double check the article and correct me on that, but let's put it this way. You don't have to know that for the question. The question is just how does it uh, how does our argument against this work? Okay, I see no other hands. So any other questions on anything in Unit 2? Yep. Um, I missed a couple of terms from Chapter 5, um, competing desire and direction of Say the term again. Competing desire and direction of fate. Good, so competing desire the idea there is, so people often say things like, I did such and such, but I didn't really want to. So some of you this week, maybe, in the midst of studying and say, okay, I'm choosing to study, but I don't want to do this. And if you have, I'm seeing some nodding. Some of you have fun studying? <laughs> huh. um, so uh, when you're in that state, actually you could reflect on it, maybe think what you uh, believe about Hume's theory. So Hume's gonna say, at some level, that doesn't make sense because uh, Hume's theory is that uh, says that desires are what motivate us to do things. Beliefs alone can never motivate you to do things. So uh, Hume's account of a situation like that is you have competing desires. You have the desire to be lazy and scroll through TikTok, but you also have the desire to do well in this course. Uh, and for some of you, uh, the latter desire will be stronger. So that, that's what he would say about that. Now your second question was about direction of fit. So, so humans divide mental states into beliefs and desires. So there's the uh, mental state and there's uh, the world, <coughs> or I'll say uh, the way the world is. And then you could imagine there's uh, the way you uh, 
want the world to be. So, if the mental state is a belief, it's trying to map the way the world is. If it's a desire, it's trying to map the way you want the world to be. It's not trying to be descriptive of the way the world is. That's what direction of fit relates to. Yeah, for sure. So there's the way the world is, and there's the way you want the world to be. Beliefs are mental states that are aiming at describing the way the world is. Uh, and desires are a different kind of mental state that are uh, about the way you want the world to be. So a kind of goal state. So, um, you know, uh, let's say I want uh, a beer. I don't really drink, but if I want a beer, so my belief is there's beer in the fridge. My desire is I want it in my stomach. So my desire is mapping the, the state I want the world to be in. And then my actions will try to uh, move this towards this. I will do things that try to make the world be the way I want it to be. Is that just the motor control theory? Yes, control theory is a kind of applied case of this, right? Where you um, design AI or computer systems like this. They have states that represent the way the world is, and they have goal states. And what, they will do, what they're designed to do is do things that move the state of the world towards the goal state. So direction of fit is the act of moving towards your goal state? No, d uh, good. So direction of fit is uh, what the mental state is representing. In fact, I'll go ahead and say, that specific term won't be on there, the direction of fit one. But potentially some things related to it could be. But direction of fit and conclusion of desire essentially is the Kuhnian theory of motivation. Yeah, you can think of that. So the conjunction of those two, uh, or those ideas, are the Humean theory. So the Humean theory of motivation is the idea that you know, we have these beliefs and desires and it's the desires that motivate us to do things, not the beliefs alone. So would that probably be an uh, acceptable response for the first written question, like, you know, I'm going to explain this, and then the mental state in the world, way you want the world to be, and then? No, I don't think, because, uh, so this is chapter, I think, five, I don't remember for sure, but um, it's, you could maybe do it with some creativity, but with that, with the first question, I want something to do with, um, the ways in which actions ma basically make you happier or make you have more well-being. Um, so the, the most straightforward way to do it is to use acnin or some of the things towards the end of chapter four. Yep. What chapter-ish did we talk about emotion and moral judgment? Chapter seven. Uh, chapter six, two to some degree. So for the connection between emotion and moral judgment, uh, you could use the psychopath reading, right? So psychopaths don't have normal emotions, uh, and this affects their moral judgment. Uh, you could use uh, height, obviously. Um, all the stuff after it's so like Pizarro, sh the stuff on disgust. I guess Imbar was the first author on the first disgust paper, but the stuff about disgust affecting moral judgment. So you have lots of options with uh, with the emotion question. Yep. Uh, what is sentimentalism compared to just the broader category of sentimentalism? Good, so sentimentalism is a family of views that emphasize the ways in which moral judgment are, judgments are based on emotion, and sophisticated sentimentalism has various tools to uh, account for the fact that we still do reason about morality. So one tool they have is the idea of a second order attitude. So you may have one emotion, but then an attitude about that emotion, maybe that can give reason a foothold. Um, various other things, but that's, that's the idea. So it's versions of sentimentalism that allow for us to reason about morality, even though at bottom they are uh, emotions or sentiments. Yeah. So is the, the second order attitudes, is that a way to justify your moral judgments in that view? Not justify, but a way to reason about it. So for example, you may have the first order attitude, bacon is delicious. And then second order attitude would be, I don't <coughs> like that I like bacon, because I also don't like animals suffering. So you can have 
uh, emotions that conflict with each other. So a second order attitude is an attitude about an attitude. So you may have the first order attitude, I love bacon. Second order attitude, I don't like that I love bacon. Yeah. Um, in chapter six, can you go over moral conventional distinction? Good, so uh, the moral conventional distinction, I don't really have to write it. So, so uh, it's a distinction that most uh, kids make pretty early on. It's the distinction between moral norms and conventional norms. Moral norms are ones that uh, the kids believe to be wrong whether or not an authority endorses them. Conventional ones are dependent on authority or norms or uh, what other people think. So the classic case, you know, uh, you ask a kid, is it okay to drink pop in class if the teacher says you can? A normal kid will say, yeah, that's fine. Is it okay to uh, punch your neighbor in the face if the teacher says it's okay? Most kids say no. Uh, then it's, it's still not okay, meaning they understand the moral norm is not dependent on convention. Uh, but kids at risk for psychopathy uh, often don't make that distinction. They say it's okay to punch your neighbor in the face if the teacher says you can. Okay, other, yep. There's a term, it's kind of long, from the Harris Papers, separation between acts being evolutionarily advantageous and good for the well-being. Okay, so uh, I'll tell you now, that one won't be on the, on the test. Um, the idea there was just that, uh, so Harris's conception is that uh, what defines what's right and wrong is what contributes to well-being, and he thinks then you can build a kind of science of morality. He says that to distinguish himself between, uh, from other people who say that science can determine what's right or wrong, but they do so through an appeal to evolution, and he doesn't want to, uh, to do that. Can you explain what the discuss here was about? Yeah, so it's just a questionnaire, so, you know, I think David Pizarro gave some examples like, um, but yeah, it's just a scale that measures how easily grossed out you are. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Can you go over the social intuitionist model? Good. So, um, just bring it up. So the basic, the, the core of the social intuitionist model is the idea that intuitions or emotions are what drives our moral judgment. So the top of it is the most important part. So think of the incest case. When I described the Julian Marx story, probably not very many of you thought, well, let's think about what you know, uh, Kant or Mill would say about this and deduce what's morally right. Mostly just thought, that's just seriously messed up. You just had a kind of gut reaction to it, which leads to the judgment that's morally wrong. Uh, so intuition first, judgment after, and then lastly, if asked, you can provide moral reasons for it. Uh, but the reasoning is post hoc. It's not why you came to that judgment. You're just doing the reasoning to defend what your intuition told you to think. Uh, that's the intuitionist part. The social part is most of the time when we change our mind, it's from other people reasoning with us. So as you see here, there's solid lines for someone else's reasoning. Uh, influencing our intuition. There's a dotted line going from reasoning to intuition. Dotted line meaning, yeah, maybe sometimes we do this, but Haidt wants to maintain that's very unusual. Most of the time when we change our mind is from other people reasoning with us. Our own reasoning is mostly biased in favor of defending the intuitions we already get from our gut. Any questions about the social intuitionist model? Okay, uh, other questions? Yep. Um, could you please explain the ordinary conception of moral judgment? Uh, yes, what reading is that in? Uh, I think you need to read a second. Actually, I'll find it too. I think, okay, wait. My answer it's, will depend on what it's uh, It's the chapter comments. six, book. Hmm, I forget what it means. So obviously what it means is uh, there's like kind of convention. Actually, here, it's not going to be on the test. <laughs> there you go. Um, but what it means is, uh, you know, as a you know, linguistic community, there's kind of norms for what the term moral judgment means. I just forget what it is talking about in that context. So Merry Christmas, it's not on the test. Wow. Moral. 
Conventional moral judgments yep. or moral judgments or something. Uh, moral, yeah, so uh, moral realism is the view that it's the same as what Street calls a mind independent conception of value. So uh, to say that uh, lying is wrong or slavery is wrong or whatever uh, is to describe something that's true whether or not anyone believes it. Another way of thinking about it is uh, moral truths in this view are similar to scientific truths. Think about like the flat earth case. If someone says the earth is flat, even if everyone in the world says the earth is flat, they're all just wrong. Uh, whereas anti-realism, there are different versions, but the simple way to define it is it's people who don't think that. They think that there are no uh, mind-independent moral truths. Oh, there yep. Can you explain sentimentalism again? Yeah, it's just the, you could do one sentence, just the view that moral judgments are based on emotion. Or sentiment. How is that different from sophisticated sentimentalism? Yeah, so sophisticated sentimentalism adds different resources to explain the fact that we still can reason about our moral judgments. So a sophisticated sentimentalism is someone who says something like this. Yes, moral judgments are at bottom the product of emotion, but we can still reason about them in different ways. Also not on the task. Uh, the answer is the effect is bad. Childhood neglect is bad for the oxytocin system, but uh, don't worry about it. Yep. Yeah, so this is in the context, this is something you could potentially use for one of the written. So um, the idea is, uh, so chapter four spends a lot of time talking about different conceptions of well-being. So uh, there's the hedonistic conception where uh, happiness is just you know pleasure. Just uh, you know, the good life is just one that has more pleasure. There's Aristotle's view where uh, well-being uh, is in part associated with fulfilling your function. So uh, you know if we use the term well-being of an axe, we would say it's a good functioning axe if it cuts well. For humans, given that we are uh, social and rational beings, we are flourishing when we uh, use those functions well. And so if you have that conception, the Aristotelian conception, then the science of human nature really matters. As we learn what human beings are like, what our nature is, then we learn about what well-being looks like. And given that evolutionary and psychological science tells us that we are groupish, right, we are naturally social, that provides more support for the idea that um, moral behavior is important for well-being because moral behavior is necessary for group cohesion and groupishness is part of our nature. Sorry I said that a bit fast, but uh, that's the idea there. Yeah. Sorry, do you mind repeating like the last thing you said, moral behavior is important because... Yeah, so moral behavior is important if you're an Aristotelian uh, because it's necessary for maintaining group relations uh, and being in a group, being part of a group is part of our nature. And remember that for Aristotle, fulfilling your nature is part of what it means to have well-being or flourishing. Can you go over the effect of incidental emotions on moral judgments? Good. So incidental emotions means emotions you happen to be feeling at the time you make a moral judgment. So there's some emotions that are just moral judgments, like you know outrage or whatever. But incidental might mean you happen to be sad when you make a judgment, or you happen to be grossed out. Uh, not by the moral thing you're evaluating, but, but just you happen to feel it. So experimental psychologists will uh, manipulate that in the lab. They'll have smelly garbage nearby while you read a dilemma and make a judgment uh, to make you feel disgust. And there's various studies showing that if you manipulate incidental emotions, this changes moral judgment in various ways. Don't have to worry about the details, uh, but that's the idea. Should those be thought of to some degree as like two opposing pairs, or are they not really? Uh, yeah, like what's the relationship between them? Like, is it 
Good. Best versus fundamentals and intrinsic versus extrinsic, or is it sort of four categories that are all? So for intrinsic versus extrinsic, they are usually thought of as competing pairs. Quest and fundamentalism, I don't think are usually put that way in a scale, but you could think of them that way. They definitely are in tension with each other. Uh, so if you want to think of them as two competing pairs, that probably would give you some insight. Other questions? Yep. Can you go over the two-factor theory of emotion? Yep. Excuse me. So uh, the two factors are the physiological response, Uh, and your interpretation uh, of the physiological response. And those two things together produce the emotion. So earlier, more simplistic theories like William James's theory uh, overemphasized the physiological component. So for James, uh, the physiological reaction comes first and produces the emotion. The problem with that is many emotions have very similar physiological profiles, so it doesn't seem like they're going to be able to do the work of explaining why we have different sorts of emotions. So what Schachter and Singer say is, you have the physiological reaction, fast heart rate, sweaty palms, whatever, uh, but depending on various things in the context or information that you have, that will determine how you interpret that physiological activity, and so those two together produce the emotion. So a simple case, I think I used something like this in class. If I'm walking in the woods and I hear footsteps, my heart rate goes up. If I turn around and it's a wolf, I will interpret the fast heart rate as fear. If I turn around and it's a friend, I will interpret it as I'm pleasantly surprised to see my friend. Yep. Can you define psychopathy? Yeah, so psychopathy, there's different definitions in the books, but generally speaking, it's defined as a cluster uh, concept there's a set of traits that tend to go together. Um, so they include like pathological lying, uh, lack of empathy is often thought to be at the core of it. Um, they're very uh, fearless, uninhibited, and uh, socially dominant. So that kind of constellation of traits that tend to go together. Other questions? Yep. Um, what's pro-social standing? So just giving money to other people. Yeah. Yeah. Hume on moral judgments? Yeah, I forget which chapter it is, but he's, what he's going to he is a sentimentalist. He's like kind of the sentimentalist. So he's going to say that moral judgments uh, are a product of certain kinds of emotions or sentiments. Uh, the caveat he adds is they have to be the kinds of sentiments that are more broad. So sentiments like, I don't like it when people suffer. Right. That's broad enough that it can be kind of the basis of moral judgment. But for Hume, it's not a judgment like Kant that you de uh, where you derive it from reason, it's just how you feel. And if you don't feel it, well then you're kind of out of the moral conversation. I think I saw another hand here. Right. Yep. Uh, so from sentimentalism, or I guess generally uh, moral anti-realism, how does it uh, reconcile moral responsibility for someone, if, if someone's a psychopath, and they do things that mm. you think are bad, uh, how does it reconcile with it, whether they are responsible or what they did is actually morally wrong in any sense? So it's a good question, so I'll answer it just shortly, because basically the unit four, like 70% of it is on this very question about moral responsibility, although it's more so in connection to the free will issue than sentimentalism. So what I would say is, um, you know, if you're a sentimentalist uh, or an anti-realist, you just have to hope that more people are on your side. Like if you're one of the guys with nice intuitions that don't want to hurt people, you have to hope that we get enough people behind that that we put the psychopath in a cage because we'd all like it better if they weren't going around killing us. A little bit of a uh, flippant answer, but th that would be what I would say. Any other questions? Yes. Um, just to go over the Ackman ratings, 
Yep. Um, her findings are cross cultural and that spending on others predicts happiness more than spending on self. Yeah, so she did two kinds of studies, uh, both correlational and experimental. So if you just ask people how much do you give to charity and how happy are they, you find a positive correlation uh, in a large number of countries. And if you do an experiment where you randomly assign people to either get money and they're told to spend it on themselves or others, um, or I think it's you're given the option to spend it on others, but everyone chooses to uh, if given the option. Uh, being in the pro-social condition makes them feel happier than being in the spend on self condition. Yeah? When you first talked about Yuna and Monia, you said Aristotle argued that you could not see how well one's life was until you see their grandchildren. Yes. Can you uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, so this is the word that if you read the Nicomachean Ethics in English, it's often translated as happiness. Um, it's probably better to translate it as flourishing. So having a life that is in accordance with your nature and that sort of goes well, not from the perspective of, oh, you feel good inside, like the hedonists say, um, but you know, it's a positive, well-lived life that has good effects and that is, as I say, in accordance with your Good, yeah, so the, the Nova effect. Um, so there's an action that leads to an, an outcome. And the outcome is foreseen. So the person knows the action will lead to that outcome, but it's not the main goal. It's not what they're primarily aiming at. So think of the, the CEO, right? He, he's gonna release this product, it's going to either hurt or help the environment. He says, I don't care about that, I just wanna make lots of money. So he knows it's going to hurt or help the environment, he foresees it, but it's not what he's mainly aiming at. So the question is, is that outcome produced intentionally? And if you ask people, again, except for this class, what you find is if it's a bad outcome, people are likely to judge that it was intentional. If it's a good outcome, people are uh, un more likely to conclude it was not intentional. So in brief, that's the gnome effect. The gnome effect is the asymmetry between uh, what people judge, whether it's a good or bad outcome. outcome of it being uh, seen as intentional or not intentional be seen as like a post hoc rationalization in order to ascribe responsibility for something that you feel as well? That's one way of explaining it. Um, calling it post hoc is maybe unfair to people. I mean, one thing it, I think what Nob wants to say is this tells us something about what we mean when we say intentional. When we say intentional, part of what we mean is, you know, to use your term, do you deserve moral responsibility for this? So if it's a bad, moral responsibility means like, yeah, you're responsible for what you did. If it's a bad outcome, that means punishment. If it's a good outcome, that means reward. And most people probably don't want to give rewards to the CEO who helps the environment even though it's not his main goal. But we probably do want to punish the CEO who leads to hurting the environment uh, even though it wasn't his main goal. So given that, that like aspect of uh, the definition in this case of intentional is like, not clear to the actual people making the judgments, is that not an incorporation of our intuition, right, in that, in that term, right? Could, yeah, so I guess what, yes, I, if I understand your question, part of what's going on here, if Nob's explanation is right, is people's intuitions about when punishment or praise is warranted does affect how they judge whether uh, intentionality should be ascribed to someone or not. Now, if some eyes are glazing over, this is more advanced than you need for the, for the test, but it's, it's a very good question. Um, in Nichols, one of the terms is empirical moral rationalism. Do you mind defining that again? Yeah, so em empirical moral rationalism is the view that um, moral judgments are caused by reason. 
It's called empirical because that's the kind of thing you have to establish through observation. Right? Reasoning is a kind of capacity that we have, right? rationality. And the question is, do those capacities, like in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex or wherever they are, do those capacities cause our moral judgments? Yep. And then also, so the same reason, uh, reading, the psychopathic deficit in psychological effective response to distress of others. Yeah, I think That's it's physiological, but, but yeah. So, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so the idea there is uh, psychopaths do not, or at least they respond less, uh, physiologically and emotionally to watching someone in pain. So if I was to show you all a video of a kid in pain, most of you, maybe all of you, I don't know, I don't know if psychopaths would take a class like this, but um, would, uh, you know, have some reaction. Your heart rate would go up, your amygdala would get activated. Like there's various responses you would have. Psychopaths have a, either none of that or a more muted kind of response like that. And Nichols wants to say that's why they don't make the moral conventional distinction. <coughs> distinction. Any other questions? Yep. Um, sorry, I just have to start this out. Pizarro's reading. So moral judgments are based off of prior reasoning, mm. um, and that's through cognitive appraisal. Cognitive. So the, the broad claim that Pizarro and the other co-authors want, or actually no, that one just has two. Pizarro and Bloom uh, want to say is. Even though in many cases intuitions do determine our moral judgment, often it's past reasoning that shapes what our intuitions today are. Uh, part of it can be through cognitive reappraisal, which can change our intuitions and emotions in various ways. And part of it is through uh, control over the input, meaning uh, you know, our intuitions are shaped by the kinds of experiences we have, the kinds of conversations we have, things we encounter. Um, and given that we exert some control over our environment and over the kinds of things we encounter, that can change what our intuitions wind up becoming. That's the idea there. Yeah. So is there some sort of like heated argument for empirical moral rationalism here where it's saying that your judgments are being determined by reasons, like the reasons are causing the intuitions, sorry, that are then leading to your moral judgments? Yes, it, so exactly. Like, yeah. yeah, so Bloom and Pizarro there are arguing for Heights findings being compatible with a kind of modified moral rationalism. I think that's the empirical moral rationalism. That's the right way to think about that article. Okay. And can you uh, extend this sort of to thinking about like at the very beginning of when you're forming your moral opinions or like intuitions, they are just intuitions like from case selection or reciprocal altruism? As in like the cycle started with intuition, um, Intuition, reason, and then goes back to intuition. Yeah, sense? I think Pizarro and Bloom don't address the origin of uh, moral intuitions, but they probably would say so. I, I know both of them pretty well. Like, not personally, but I, I, know, <laughs> I know what they said. Although I did meet Bloom once. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they would say that ultimately it does come from kin selection, reciprocal altruism. Uh, but, uh, so. So, my yeah. final like, point that, with that, with that origin, would that then be a reason to favor sentimentalism over empirical moralism? Yeah, I guess then it's going to be a question of how you define the terms. Like, how much does reasoning have to contribute for it to be rationalism? And there I'll say, you don't have to decide that, that issue. So it'll come down to the definition at that point. Yeah? Could you explain the dual process model again? Oh, yeah, right. That's in the height reading. So we'll, we'll talk a lot about the dual process model in Unit 3. It's like the main theme. Uh, very simply, the dual process model appears all over the place in psychology, and it's the idea that uh, there's the quick intuitive system and the slow reflective system. Uh, what Haidt says is, actually let me back up, what most people say is that the slow reflective system exists to correct the first system. So most of the time we go through intuition, sometimes we think more carefully and correct our intuitions, but Haidt says no, uh, the reflective system is primarily to defend the first system. It's just, so we make our judgments using intuition and our gut reactions, and the slow reflective system is there as backup in case we need to argue for 
uh, our views to others. Green is going to disagree with this. Green is going to say that uh, height underestimates how much reasoning can influence our judgments. Yep. Um, and then in INBAR, the implicit association test, was there like an actual definition of it or just the example of like the good word and homosexuality? Yeah, so it, it's a way of measuring uh, people's you know, implicit biases. So yeah, so how quickly, if you want a definition, how quickly do people you know, press the button when it's good word and some group of some kind or bad word and some other group? And then you switch uh, the association and find if there's a difference between how easy it is to push uh, you know, good word and this group. Okay. I see no other hands, five minutes to go. Uh, we'll call it there. Uh, so I will see you all on Friday for the test. If you have questions you're too shy to ask, you can come up and ask.